Right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Finance and Assets Committee. And a particular welcome to those who may be watching on the live stream. Referring to the live stream, members, can I please re remind you to turn on and off your microphones when invited to speak? Agenda item one is public question time. Tracy. There are no public questions this afternoon. Agenda item two is apologies and substitutions. Tracy. Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from Councillor Mark Goldsack and Councillor David Ambrose Smith is here as substitute. Thank you. Item three is declarations of interest. Does any member have any declaration of interest to make? on any items on the agenda. If not, we'll move on to agenda item four, which is the minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve. Those from the meetings held on the 24th of March and 19th of May. Does any member wish to raise any points of accuracy with either of the sets of minutes? If not, I will propose them. I have a seconder. Happy to propose, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bovington. I'll sign those at the end of the meeting. Agenda item five is Chairman's announcements. And I have invited Paul Remington, Chairman, John Hill, Managing Director, and Nigel Ankers, the Finance Manager at East Cam's Trading Company, to attend and contribute to relevant items on the agenda. And welcome. We now move to items for decision and agenda item number the sixth is the motion referred from Council on Accessible Toilets. Members will recall that full Council on 21st of April 2022 decided to refer this motion for discussion at this meeting of Finance and Assets Committee. We already have a proposal and seconder in, as proposer Councillor Dupre and Councillor Downey seconded the uh, motion at Council. We also have an amendment proposed by myself and seconded by Councillor Hunt. Uh, as Councillor Downey isn't here. It was, it was duly proposed and seconded at the council meeting, so right. it stands as proposed and seconded. Right. So I'll come back, Councillor Downey, to speak. Uh, Councillor Dupre, would you like to propose the motion? I'm sorry, Chair, I thought I already had. Oh, sorry, you. Would you like to speak to the motion? I look oh. to the officer for advice, but my understanding the was that the, the motion having been proposed and seconded at full council, that the, the movement now was straight to the moving of the amendment. That would be how it would normally happen, would it not? Councillor, you do have a right to speak again on the motion because it has been referred to council if you choose to at this stage. I think I will say what I want to say on the motion when it comes to the debate on the motion as amended. And I'm happy. I don't want to do that twice. Right. So uh, I, I said what I had to say, and I will, I will reserve that to the second part of the debate. All right. Thank you, Councillor DeBrake. Sorry about the confusion. The same members, uh, we, we are now looking at the amendment. And in proposing the amendment, I would just like to explain some of our thinking. And, and from the outset, we'd like to thank Councillor Dupre and Downey for raising the issue. Firstly, in the second bullet point in under the this council notes that, I'm sorry, but my limited abilities with track changes means that for some reason, the deletion of the final two sentences was not recognized. However, the reason for deletion is covered by the new third bullet point stating that there is a change in places toilet at the Hyde Leisure Centre in Ely. The change in the second section is to recognise that the council should do what it can to make public toilets accessible. And as far as the section this council resolves, I believe that the reasoning in that section of our amendment is self-explanatory. This committee needs the information so we can come to a consensus and decide what we should do and how we set a budget to do it. And that is why we're asking for the report to come back in November. We agree with the need for signage in our toilets, 
and also agree that it is appropriate to inform others as and when more change in places funding becomes available. Councillor Hunt, you seconded. Are you reserving your right to speak? Yes, I do, Chair. Thank you. Members. Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chair. Before I speak, I would like to ask a question. I wasn't quite following you about which lines in the original motion were to be deleted in addition to the ad addition of the bullet point. Was, you were trying to tell me that there was something in there that had been deleted. Yeah, it was the final two sentences in the original second bullet point. So the one that says that starts the changing places interactive map at blah, blah, blah. Right, okay, so the wording doesn't show at all on, on here when compared to the original, right, okay, thank you. Um, in that case, I'll move to what I wanted to say. I'm going to reserve my general remarks about the issue at hand to the debate on the motion as amended, because we all know your amendment is going to pass and, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on the amendment and the, the, the changes that you are making to this motion. The first one is um, the note that there is a changing places toilet at the Hive Leisure Centre, Ely. Not many people know that, but there is, um, and I can confirm that's accurate. Um, I have also uh, asked and been advised that a member of the public who is not a member of the Hive and is uh, seriously disabled can indeed use that facility and can uh, borrow a radar key from the front desk if they don't already have one. I was interested to note that if, however, they want to use the shower facility there, which one might, if one, for example, was doubly incontinent, there's a charge of three pounds. I don't know if you know that, um, and I don't know whether you agree with me, that that seems, put it mildly unacceptable. Um, the next amendment is that uh, you propose that uh, every, not every public toilet should be accessible for people with disabilities. I disagree with that. Um, you also propose that that's only in the context of the council. Uh, and our motion, which I'll come to later, was deliberately written to be as inclusive as possible to reflect not just services and amenities provided by the council, but to reflect the lived experience of people with disabilities in East Cambridgeshire, wherever they were going and whoever owned the facility that they needed to use. It's disappointing, therefore, that the amendment has absolutely narrowed down and is only interested in the council's own assets. Our, our, our vision was that this could be an area in which the council could be a community leader, uh, but that is not to be. The next part of the amendment uh, restricts reviewing disability access only to the assets of the district council. And I repeat what I have just said about the narrowness of aspiration of that. Um, and we are to receive uh, findings in November. Um, I reserve comment on what those findings will be until we actually know what they are. Um, the next change is to uh, require the council to notify Changing Places, the national organisation, that there is provision of a Changing Places toilet at the Hive uh, Leisure Centre. That would be very good. It would be good to see it reflected on the website. However, it would also be good to see it reflected on our website. And there is no mention of that toilet facility in the public toilets page of the East Cambridgeshire District Council website, despite the fact that I mentioned that as an issue in my speech two months ago. Um, I, I've given two months warning that that's an issue. Nothing has changed, nothing has been done. And I would suggest that we put our house in order first. The next change is that when, uh, and that's a bit of an assumption, but when there is another round of government changing places funding to facilitate improvements of this sort, we will not engage with businesses and partners and have a real conversation about the best and most appropriate locations of toilets for people with disabilities, which may well be in places like um, supermarkets, uh, places in the middle of Ely um, where people will congregate, other facilities owned by other public bodies, such as the Maltings in Ely, for example, or the library owned by the County Council. 
Um, but it's we're not going to have that wide ranging or, or leisure facilities, you know, and places where people want to go. What about the cathedral? What about Anglesey Abbey? None of that is in here. And we're not going to have that, that conversation of be a real community leader. We're going to write a letter. Well, I mean, what do you want? A medal? I mean, never, never in the field of human history was the phrase, it was the least I could do, more appropriate than for that. I mean, really. Um, finally, there's a proposal to delete all reference to um, signage of public toilets that are not in our that are not our assets. And I think, again, it would have been good to be in a community leader, to be raising awareness of Crohn's and colitis and people with non-obvious disabilities who will need to use facilities in different ways. But also it deletes all reference to training for our own staff on those conditions and how they may well impact on people and of their use of toilets that are our assets. For example, the one downstairs accessible from reception. You said, Chair, that the reasoning for deleting all of these things would be self-evident. I don't understand what is self-evident about deleting a very simple and obvious suggestion that we train our own staff to be aware of these conditions. And I find that quite extraordinary. So that's my view on the amendment. I find it incredibly narrow in its ambition. Uh, I find it incredibly constrained, unimaginative, and, and basically it's just washing its hands, which is a very appropriate metaphor when we're talking about public toilets, washing its hands of responsibility to lead the community and to make East Cambridge a place that is genuinely welcoming for all people in East Cambridgeshire who want to visit and move around the district and to tourists who seek to come here and find out the many things that this district has to offer. It's incredibly disappointing. Councillor Dupre. Any further? Councillor Hunt then. I want to be sure, Chair, that anybody else has asked any questions they might have before I ask mine? Sorry, because okay, because it, this, this will then become the substantive. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I've been trying to get sort of hold of the the picture here, and um, when I first read the papers, I thought, well, I'm sure there was a, a facility that we had in the hive, um, and that seems to have been adjusted now. And I'm, I'm, I'm keen to know if the uh, facilities that are Bar Hill and Eddington are the only ones in uh, the city of Cambridge and South Cams. So I've got some idea of what facilities exist in the whole county. Does anybody know if there are any others in South Cams apart from Bar Hill or any in the city of Cambridge? Chair, that information is readily available on the Changing Places National Map on the website. I would encourage Councillor Hunt to have a look. Um, there's also provision at Milden Hall in Suffolk for people the other side. Um, so if you are going to somewhere in the, uh, the southeastern section of the district, then Milden Hall is probably your, your nearest. I, I noted in the motion the nearest facilities, not the only facilities, but that information is readily available. So hence, Chair, my question is, are there any others in South Cams? I mean, we know there's, uh, I, we know the City of Ely has a facility. I didn't want, I really wanted to find out if the City of Cambridge had one. That's not information I have in my head, Councillor. Okay, well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, and I certainly uh, agree with uh, Counts. Councillor Dupre, that uh, where these facilities exist, they should be promoted. And I think that's um, something that's quite useful and we should make sure we do promote these facilities uh, because we want to be, as we can be, we want to be welcoming to visitors of all, uh, all, all, all categories of visitors we want to be welcoming to. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Austin. Um, I think 
that will be looked at when new boards go up. We have had conversations about that. Thank you. Councillor Trapp. Thank you. I've just looked at the map and there are two facilities in Cambridge itself, one by another one by Trumpington, another one by Barhill. South Camps. Okay. Yes, Bar Hill. Through the chair, please. Boxworth, Huntington. That's not in South Camps, but they, you can look up your map yourself, actually. There's quite a few. Right. Can we. We're... <laughs> right. I'm moving on. We are moving on to vote on the amendment. I thought you had the right to sum up on the when it becomes the substantive motion. Tracy has nodded. I believe I have the right to sum up to, on the amendment. As new sorry, I thought motion, I thought Dupre, you, you have the right to sum up on the amendment. My mistake. I apologise. It was not intended. Thank you, Chair. I will sum up briefly on the amendment. I have to say, uh, I've said all I'm going to say on the content of the amendment, but I'm very surprised. I had expected a robust defence of the reasoning behind this amendment, and I haven't seen that. I've seen a desultory question about where in other districts there may be such toilets, but I, I've not seen anywhere from anyone people coming to say, actually, this is a really good change that we've made to this motion and to make it better. And I'm really surprised that having gone to such lengths, deferred this for two months, refused to debate it at council, and then come up with amendment that waters it down and makes it worse. There's no attempt at all to defend in any way the reasons for watering this motion down in, in the way that it has been. That's all I will say. And I really would encourage members to think, do you want to be community leaders or not? And if you want to be community leaders, then you vote against this amendment and you vote in favour of a much more thorough and robust motion. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we now move to the vote. Those in favour of the amendment, please show. Those against? The amendment, Sorry, the is, amendment is carried by seven votes to four. Thank you. So the amendment now becomes the substantive motion. As I've already said what I was going to say when I proposed it, so. <laughs> Councillor Dupre. Chair, I'm happy to speak, but I'm uh, looking to Tracy again. Do I speak last in this part of the debate as well? That's my understanding. Obviously, if, if, you, if, there is, if you want to speak now on the substantive amendment, there is opportunity for members to speak now. I'm happy to cede to anybody who wants to precede me. Members? <laughs> Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I... <laughs> I mean, I'm somewhat perplexed at the indignation from, from the opposite side of the chamber. I mean, essentially, what we're doing is supporting, supporting the proposal to, to go out and find out what is possible, uh, what is reasonable, you know, what is deliverable. Uh, we're going to deal with the signage issues uh, straight away. Um, you know, and frankly, I don't think there's any need for such indignation. Uh, I, I'm absolutely supportive of the fact that we should do everything that we can to make our toilets as accessible as possible within the realms of reasonableness. I mean, there are constraints, you know, some of our facilities are in uh, difficult buildings that, you know, don't have space and, and all that sort of thing. So uh, I look forward to receiving the information back from offices when we get it and doing what we can uh, and, and making our district as welcoming and friendly as possible. And I think I've noted that there were, uh, I think somebody, I heard somebody say that there are four uh, across across the rest of Cambridge here, I think I heard someone say. So, um, you know, we have one changing places, um, toilet, accessible toilet in East Cam so far, and, and I hope that we may be able to improve on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Huffer indicated next, then Councillor Trapp. Uh, thank you. If I can give some clarification, there is one changing places um, toilet in the Grand Arcade in the centre of Cambridge. The other one is in the Lutheran Church on Shaftesbury Avenue. So, or Shaftesbury Road. So we're not a plethora considering the size of Cambridge um, and the, um, the population obviously that would need access to this. I mean, 
I have a family member who has had ulcerative colitis for 10 years. Um, so I'm fully aware of the, 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 the stresses and strains that go with, with something like this. Um, but by the same token, we cannot demand private companies provide facilities. We can only ask and encourage. And that's exactly what we will do when we, ha when we have the information so that we can ask them to please do their public best to make sure that their staff are well provided for. I know the person that I know, the first thing he does when he walks into somewhere new is immediately look for the first toilet. But that's what people with that condition tend to do as part of their lives. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fett. Councillor Trump. Point out there's actually more than that. There's some in Addenbrooke's and the AstraZeneca site. So, and some of them are being still built. So, after having actually achieved the grant. Councillor Harris, you indicated. Yeah, I, I would certainly not say that there is a great deal of indignation, but really just going back to what Councillor Huff has said, the original wording um, at the bottom of your page here in, in the motion said engage with businesses and partner organisations. It basically said to work closely with them. It didn't say to, to force or anything else, but just to go the extra mile to make them aware what is possible to give them the kind of knowledge and information they may not actually have and the thing that that i think strikes us as a bit odd you've changed this to say right to businesses and partner organizations to make them aware of the funding well yeah fine okay but why exactly is it necessary to cut out the wording about engage encourage and so on it, it, it's as if you're deliberately saying we'll write a letter but we won't Go another step. This is the thing that causes not indignation, but kind of puzzlement. And the same is also true of the last bullet. I mean, we're not going to argue about, you know, what you've left, make sure that existing public toilets are signed, etc., and so on. But what we're suggesting is that the council has a mission to set a good example to the rest of the community. I'm very well aware that you can't tell commercial organizations what to do, of course you can't, but you can in, encourage them. You can help them to get the training that they need. It's, it's just where we're saying, let's do that. You're saying, no, let's not do that. Let's do this, which is the right thing. I'm still glad to see it here. Absolutely the right thing, but it could could have been more ambitious and I'm kind of puzzled you know so no indignation just why but anyway Councillor Austin I'm a bit confused as to what training the staff actually need can you help me with that please and I think one can pick up on that because we have had a number of cases in which staff in some um, commercial um, premises, in particular restaurants, coffee shops, things like this, um, may simply not be able to recognize the issues that sufferers sometimes have. And training here could just mean provision, provision of information, but provision of information in the way that means it is properly internalized and they actually have a set of steps, things to do. So how to identify somebody who does have colitis or, or Crohn's, um, the kind of things they should say and do to treat them well and to welcome them and so on. It's basic stuff. It, it's, but it's certainly idle to suggest that training is not needed when we do have cases of people who are not treated as well as one would like. I say this is, it's something that is so obvious. I kind of don't get why you would cross out the word training, except that it may imply to some people a contract or, or a, um, a duty on the council. And I do understand that the council needs to be careful about one moment, not having too much dumped on its limited resources, of course. But anyway, yeah. That's Austin. 
maybe people don't know that if they've got Crohn's disease or any of those conditions, they can actually have a card and they can show it in shops, pubs, restaurants, and they can go in and use the facilities. Yeah, I agree if they need proper washing facilities, maybe they won't get, they'll, they'll have basins and things like that, but they can apply for a card. Thank you, Councillor. I've got a family member who's got one. So we seem to and be batting this back and forwards a bit. But in this case, fine. okay, but it's fine, very helpful. But in this case, all we're suggesting is that it would be a good idea to make sure that members of staff understand what this card is and what um, and, and how they should treat people carrying it. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically like that. It's not suggesting that there, there be extensive workshops and things like this. It's just that we, we don't see why you would remove the reference to training, given the fact that it's pretty light touch. And it's just, it's just a way of helping this go more smoothly. That's all. But you know, let, let's 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 stop it because it is what it is. Councillor Will. Sorry, I do have to just come in on this point, and it's um, it's a real pity because it actually demonstrates exactly why there's a problem with inclusion. I'm not talking about diversity. I'm not talking about equality. I'm talking about inclusion. Yes, there are cards. I have a card which asks places to allow me to use the facilities. Tell you what, nine out of ten don't. So, training is a good idea. We're well aware that most of the reason why people, you know, behave wrongly is because they simply don't understand. I mean, I look at this and we say, great, there's a, there's a changing places, toilet, at hive, leisure centre, great. So what we've got to do is to be able to access that because it's actually behind the pay um, area, as I understand it. So you've then got to go to the reception and ask for permission to go in to use it. Anyone else wanting to use the public toilets doesn't have to ask permission to go in and use them. You then have the fact that what happens if that person behind the desk at that particular time is not a person who actually knows about this scheme. And, you know, who's going to provide the training? Well, we've just talked about training. You know, yes, it may be down to the leisure centre in this particular case to provide that training, make sure their stuff are trained. But you can never be absolutely certain. And when something is so occasional, it is a real pity. Um, you know, the simple fact that to fulfil their basic needs... They may have to pay a charge of three pounds when how much is it for non-disabled people to use the toilets in the city you know that is the difference and those are the kind of things that we need to address and this doesn't address any of that yeah you made an amendment you put that in there and one of the reasons why it is questionable is because of precisely those points it is not publicly accessible you have to go through a different procedure to be able to access it. I'm afraid you just highlighted all of the reasons why those on the other side simply do not grasp what inclusion is. They don't grasp the biases that they sit with. Thank you. Councillor Dupre, just finish up. Thank you. To conclude then, I'd like to rewind to why we got here in the first place. And the reason why we got here in the first place was that the government advertised the availability of grants to local authorities to provide and install changing places toilets. Those toilets could be anywhere. They didn't have to be county council. They didn't have to be council assets. They could be in the private sector. They could be in um, voluntary and, and non-profit sector, they could be anywhere, but the grant was offered through the, the councils. Most councils, I think, got something. Um, in some cases, those grants were, a lot of cases, those grants were in six figures, so over £100,000. Every district 
Council in Cambridgeshire got some money to do something to make this better, except for East Cambridgeshire. And the reason East Cambridgeshire got no money, the only district in Cambridgeshire to get zero, was because it didn't even bother to ask. That's why Councillor Downey and I decided that we needed a motion to raise this as an issue and to make the council and the public aware of the importance of this. We have lost out, therefore, hugely, where every other Cambridgeshire district benefited and got a reasonably large sum of money to do a good piece of work, which could have been anywhere. And the fact that that could have been anywhere is why narrowing the focus, as this amendment now has, to the council's own assets is so pointless because the opportunity was for anywhere, for the maltings, for the library, for the ground floor of a, of a supermarket, for, for the cathedral, for Anglesey Abbey, for anywhere, but delivered through the council. And that lack of vision of partnership, that lack of interest in having a real conversation with all of those other bodies about how can we make East Cambridge better for disabled people is frankly extraordinary and shows absolutely why this council didn't even bother to ask for the money that was going begging. So that's the first point I want to make, and we need to remember that. Now, we're told by Councillor Huffer that there's not a plethora of these facilities. That's why the council put grants in. And as a result of those grants, there will be half a dozen new additional changing places facilities across the whole of Cambridge. There will be, not on the map yet, the, the grants were only a few months ago, will be half a dozen additional new changing facilities, changing place facilities across Cambridgeshire. Um, and they will be delivered in partnership. And that's, there isn't a plethora, that's why we need more. And even the government recognised that we just didn't want to be part of it. Absolutely, we cannot demand that places like the cathedral or Anglesey Abbey install these facilities. Of course, we can't demand that. Nobody's suggesting it. The motion didn't suggest it. What we suggested was that we should be part of, indeed lead a conversation with those facilities about how together with the council as community leaders, we can make East Cambridgeshire a better place for disabled people to go and come and visit, whether from outside the district or within the district. Not a demand, a conversation and a way of assessing where, if this grant comes again, we could actually have a conversation with those facilities and say, look, this grant's come around event. again, it's channeled through us, but you know, we think that you would be a super venue for that. How about we, we work with you to put something in? That's what it's all about. And that's what this amendment that is now passed into the substantive motion just doesn't get. I want to say something finally about training. Um, you clearly didn't listen to what Councillor Downey said at the full council in April, where he described in excruciating detail the difficulties that people with Crohn's ulcerative colitis and so on can face, the challenges, the, the, the boundaries that they face, the barricades that they face when they try to use a toilet. Yes, there may be cards, but how many staff in retail, in, in cafes, whatever, are trained about recognizing those cards, understanding what they mean. How many of them are trained also in de-escalating situations? Because what you get with people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is that they're in the toilets, they're in there for longer than would be the case. There's an altercation. Some member of the public says, oi, bang on the door, stop, you know, you should be out of there training for staff in de-escalating those situations and understanding what's really going on. So to delete all that training is extraordinary. It is necessary, cards or no cards. Understanding how these things work is necessary. Training is a good thing. And to decide you can't even be bothered to do that. Uh, as I said, this is very much now about the least you can do. 
and we will support it because it is, although it's the least you can do, it's better than nothing, but it's not much better than nothing, frankly. And I have to conclude by saying that we will commit to revisiting this as and when we lead East Cambridgeshire District Council and we promise the people of East Cambridgeshire that we will be better than this. Thank you, Councillor Debray. That concludes, sorry, that concludes that debate. We now move to the vote. All those in favour of the what is now the substantive motion, please show. Unanimous, thank you. Can you now move to, uh, Emma, I'll just give you time to. We now move to agenda item seven, the ECTC business plan for 2022-23. I'm going to ask Emma Grimmer to introduce the item, but before I do, can I remind members that there is an exempt appendix for this item. If any member wishes to discuss that exempt appendix, we will need to move into exempt session and stop the live stream. So does any member wish to raise items on the, in the exempt paper. If not, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Chairman. I'm speaking now in my capacity as the Director for the Property and Commercial Services of East Cam's Trading Company. And I'm going to walk you through the business plan. Um, I'll talk through the different elements and then hand over to Nigel, who will then take you through finances. So committee will be familiar with the structure of this business plan. Um, so I'll start off with the governance and management, which is outlined on page eight of the business plan. And you will see that there is a change from last year's business plan to this year's and it now recognizes um, the corporate unit manager, Sally Bonnet, as serving on the board of directors, replacing the seat that I held previously. And this has all been uh, correctly filed at Companies House and is reflective of that. So if I move on to sort of the risk management, which is laid out on page 12, I don't intend, Chairman, to take you through all of the risk management, but I restructured this following the feedback from the committee uh, previously. And now you'll see that it reflects where there's an inherent risk, the key controls that are in place, and then it gives a residual risk score, more familiar with what we see, what you've seen at the council. I have just a few key points. Remove the risk around the local government reform, as I don't believe that this is a risk that uh, is going to affect the company in the short or the medium term. I've also removed the specific risk around Brexit, um, because the passage of time since leaving from Brexit, we now see, and it sits within its specific risk area, increased costs, that's sort of increased construction costs, etc. And I've also restructured the financial risk to reflect how the new loan position sits since the last council approval. I've also removed all risk owners that are not directly linked to the company as previously it did have overlapping risk owners. So turning now to commercial services, which begins on page 17. Members will be aware that the company has two commercial services, the first being Ely Markets and the second being the grounds maintenance. So I'll start with Ely Markets. Ely Markets had an incredibly strong year last year, and this is in no small thanks to the great efforts that the team have put in. Uh, they dealt with the beginning of last year, moving out of the financial year, moving out of COVID and then strengthening the mini markets, moving in to do more market events. There was a bump of Christmas events and uh, more recently we had the introduction of Foodie Fridays and whilst not in last year's business plan, it's this year's business plan, we also had the Jubilee celebrations which were uh, very well received. As a company we've always said that it was, you know, community formed a large part of the commercial delivery and this does shine through the service and um, the market's always been successful and this year we've seen a noticeable increase in footfall on the markets due to what we're putting on so this business plan now looks to the future and to do that it's essential that we make some investment in the service and uh, by the things like provision of um, replacing aging infrastructure such as the stalls which are decades old um, new vehicles to transport the stalls as well and invest in human resources. We've always been staffing the markets from eight years ago. We now need to resource it and staff it today um, with permanent dedicated resource. 
Back in 2017, we did a study which most members will be familiar with, which showed the importance of markets in the economy. And for this year, we look to refresh that study. So we expect another great year from the market. And even with the investment reflected in this business plan, the markets will show a modest return. Moving on to grounds maintenance. It's been another good year for the grounds maintenance team. And we've been able to maintain the contracts that we have and even win a few small ones. You have to grow very slowly because it's difficult to resource if you grow too large. So it's quality. We can embed that quality into the service. Um, we started the grounds maintenance element of the company back in 2017. And just as an, uh, the first year, 10% of the grounds maintenance income was from other customers. We've now grown that to around 26%. So you can see the growth within the company. Doing this has allowed us to maintain that £100,000 reduction to the council's contract. So we'll move on into property development. So members will be aware that we have two main active sites, one at Haddenham, and one which is called Arbor Square, but also known as MOD Phase 1. Haddenham continues to go from strength to strength, and we're waiting to complete on the legals for the five CLT homes, and everything else is still working its way through legal. We've got four more plots released for sale and one waiting to be built. Um, then we have 15 of the homes. Which, sorry, I've lost my place. We've got the shed, then we go into the Arbor Square where we have um, the refurbishment of the site where we have delivered 15 shared ownership properties. We've exchanged on 15 and now we're going through the final sales. So they're on their, their final destination with, with uh, shared ownership buyers. We've got three of the homes now. Can, people moved in and one due very soon and the rest are now coming on stream nicely. So for the market homes on the MOD site, we've got, um, we're most of the way through that, through that. We sold 33, we have 22 under offer, going through legals, four been released for sale and some are still waiting to under construction and modification. On both of these, the company for the loans that are owed to the CPCA. We're on track to make the, the loan repayments by the deadlines. Uh, and as we've always said, the one for the MOD phase one is tight, but we are on track to make those payments. So another project that's in motion is Kennet. And members will be aware of um, the progress that that made during the last year. So, and we'll have seen that the planning application has now been submitted for the first reserve matters and the perimeter road, and we will continue to work closely as part of the delivery board to ensure the scheme um, that, we, that we signed up for is the one that is delivered. And we will also be working with the landowners to get the commercial development and the care home retirement to the market. There's new parts of the business plan this year. Um, the first part of that will be the delivery of the former Paradise Pool site. Members will be aware that we have planning permission for the site and the council has agreed to sell this to ECTC. A full detailed business case will go to the board later on in the summer. And the team at the moment are getting ready to discharge the conditions which will help inform the business plan and give some certainty around the costs. All being well, it's planned that the site will the site will commence late autumn. And what we plan to do is we've got the site coming off Haddenham in the autumn and they'll move straight onto the Paradise site. So just as a reminder, this site was for 13 units and it will include 400k homes. MOD phase two, which is part of the business plan as well. This scheme is still going through, through the planning system and expected to go to planning committee in the coming months. If we get through planning, it's at that point, we'll establish the land value with the Ministry of Defence, and then we can look to increase, how we can increase the level of affordable housing above the 30%, which is a commitment that this has been given. And then the last up is MOD phase three. We're calling it phase three. There's not much work to be done on that during this year, but it's mentioned because it forms part of the financials and also it's part of the land swap with the NHS, which is currently ongoing. So if I take questions now, Chairman, on um, matters, or should we go into the financials with Nigel? 
I think if we go into the financials, because then I'll propose the recommendation, which is to approve it, and then we go into questions. Um, so I'm going to just walk through the finances on page 10, the business plan. Um, so if we compare the 21-22 revenues, um, there's an increase there in the commercial side of the business, which is all derived from the grounds maintenance team, um, slight increase in the value of the contract with ECDC, some additional tree works that we're doing also on behalf of ECDC and some uh, additional external contracts. The property income uh, increases substantially due to the higher number of completions in 22-23. Um, last year, we sold 37 properties overall, and in 22-23, we will sell 93 properties. 68 of those will be on the Ely site and 25 at Haddenham. And then looking into the future there, 23-24 sees the sale of the Paradise home, uh, site, homes on the Paradise site, and the future phases for MOD would be in 24-25 and the first quarter of 25 to 26. Looking at costs, um, commercial costs are up um, from last year. Some of that are two new operatives to cover the additional work um, that, that is going to take place there. And also uh, for the last year, they were effectively running too short of a full complement um, of the team. There's an increased investment in the markets, as Emma mentioned, uh, the full list of, of the, uh, those uh, investments on page 19, but it adds around about 54k to the cost for 22-23. So overall, that would leave the business with a 504k profit for 22-23. Um, plan to drop then into a, a loss for the following year. Um, mostly because the only property sales at that point would be on the Paradise Pool site. But then the return to profitability in 24, 5 and 25, 26 on the back of um, future phases at Ely and some further income from Kennet on some of the remaining land parcels there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, we are asked to uh, approve the business plan as set out in Appendix 1. I will propose that. Do I have a seconder? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bobbingdon. Right, members, we now move into questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, 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 thank you, Councillor Whelan, for the question from the Liberal Democrat group. Um, just to remind everybody that the questions and answers as tabled will be in the minutes of this meeting. Uh, first off, do the answers you've received satisfy the questions that you raised, Councillor Wheel? To a degree, um, some of them do um, ask the questions. I, there are a few bits and pieces I'd like to pick up around this. Um, firstly, um, obviously the shared ownership, it's good. It seems to have taken forever. I seem to have been um, talking to all sorts of people just about forever. <clears throat> um, here we are two, down, two years down the line and um, finally the people are moving in, which is really good. Um, Nigel, really, I guess this comes back to you. Well, actually, it's probably a more open question. In terms of um, the Kennet site, to what extent is there other things that you're going to have to do going forward with that site, or are you now completely out of that site? Oh. Through you, Chair, I think it's a question for me. Uh, for with Kenneth, we, we maintain our legal interest through the delivery board. So we work with to ensure with the landowners, with the CLT, and with the developer to ensure that that development is as we all originally envisaged. We then also have the ongoing matter with linked to the, promotion of the care, the commercial, and the, the facilities serving that. So we've got the ongoing interest there with future receipts. And then it's the overall responsibility to, for us all to ensure that it, that it is what we all originally intended it to be. And we have certain sign-offs and, and rights involved around that. From that perspective, does that mean there is additional income to come in 
in respect of all of this additional work that's going to be done. There's no additional income in terms of the residential part that's been part of the land transfer um, to Bellway that, that's, that's been announced. Um, there are additional land parcels that we retain an interest in that will be commercial and retirement homes that we may um, receive an income from in future years. I have to question then whether this is actually in accordance with international reporting standards. Um, because if you have a potential future work that you're going to have to be doing, why is there not a provision in place which would then mean that the whole of the income that has already been um, or has been agreed has not been, you know, some of that has not been set aside to allow for those future costs? There is, um, the costs are relatively small and there is an accrual in the 21-22 accounts that will cover those costs. It's capped in the contract um, for the delivery board at, I think, £20,000 per annum. That's accrued for in my 21-22 accounts. Yeah, I think we need to take some legal advice on that one. Um, if we then take out those costs from the figures we see on page 10 um, related to that, I find we're in the same position as we've been in for the last few years, that actually there is effectively, once you take into account the interest charges, which are entirely related to the property development side, you're actually making a loss on the sale of these properties. Um, I'm just curious as to, you know, that's, that's simply stating something as a fact. You know, no, nothing to be debated there or talked about the actual figures. What I'm just questioning is going forward, you're then saying that that's okay because you're going to be able to make pro profits on those properties, even or from property development, even though historically you haven't been able to do that, except in relation to this money from Kemet. Is that really a realistic basis on which to make these? Um, to, to have this business plan. Uh, yeah, having I, I think it is having looked through the plans um, for the future projects that we've got for the next year and the projects in the two or three years after. Okay, having done this for years and years and years, it. Um, you know, it's remarkable to me that we will see such a, a, a remarkable change around from the current position. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add at this moment. Any further questions? Come to Dupre. Thank you. Coming back on the answers to a couple of the questions that we've had circulated and uh, just a, a fresh ob uh, minor observation. I'll take the minor observation first, which is perhaps we could confirm. I, I never could get my head around the new math, but I think you know, on page 16, row 11, one times four still equals four, not eight. Um, so just that for note. But um, the questions I wanted to follow up on. Um, appendix one, page 11, row two, talks about the charges incurred from... ECDC uh, in respect of the services that ECDC is providing and ECTC is paying for. Um, and our question was that if ECDC weren't needed to provide these services to ECTC, if ECTC didn't exist, would ECDC not save those costs anyway? And the answer that we're given is that the services are provided within existing ECDC resources, therefore there's a saving for the council. Well, that's kind of circular. Because is that really saying that if ECTC didn't need to soak up those resources, we would still have them hanging around? Surely not. If, we're, if we've got capacity to provide to ECTC, then we're paying for those resources and getting that back. If ECTC didn't get them, didn't, didn't need those resources, what would we do with them? Would we still continue to have them on our books? That's the question. And I don't see that answered. 
The, the other question is on page 16, row 12, uh, where again, it's, it's talking about risks and suggesting that that particular risk is, um, if the, our question is, if the risk results in the organization being unable to deliver its business plan, which is what the, um, the outcome of that risk is, the effect of that risk, does not the impact of that merit a score higher than three? And the answer here is it depends on where the vacancies arise. But surely if you can't deliver your business plan, that's a fairly fundamental and fatal risk for the organization if you can't do what it is you have set yourself up and planned to do. And I'm struggling to see why three is an appropriate score for something which so strikes at the heart of what the organization is allegedly there to do. Oh. I'll take the first question. I don't think it's as simple as saying um, if you don't if you don't um, provide those resources to the company, therefore you're securing an income. That de facto, if they're not supplied to the company, they therefore wouldn't need to be costed within the council. I think it very, it very much depends on the nature of that support. Now, I'll give you an example outside of the company. But for example, when I was seconded to the CA. Uh, the, the council received an income to the CA. Um, we did make other adjustments, but not only um, in terms of compensating for, uh, not in terms of generating an excess income on that expenditure. So it, it isn't as simple as that, but clearly Council De Prey's point is in part well made and would of course, in any case, as we always do, we make adjustments to the costs related to the council. But in many instances, uh, that is not as simple as saying if we didn't get £10 from the company, we would have to reduce our income by £10. So I think it's right and appropriate in the way it's presented. Um, but clearly there are matters that Council of Praise related to that would require some reassessment if this situation was in place. But largely, and I, I go back to the example I gave you before, um, it is genuine income to the Council because there's no longer in that period of time incurring that particular cost. Thank you. Take if I take the point on the risk on the, that's identified in row 12, if you look at the risk, it's the adequacy of organisational resources to deliver the required business outcomes. The And then what's identified is a concern that it could lead to not being able to deliver the business plan. I gave it a score of three because a single lever, a single person within the organisation would not generate concern that you wouldn't be able to deliver the business plan as a whole. No one individual, no company relies on one individual. So it took a, a middle view that's the, and then you go to the likelihood being one, it took a middle view that it would, if it was increased to all of a sudden all eight staff walked out, then it would of course in, increase it to a five. So it took a, a pragmatic view that a three was the appropriate score there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Harris. I, um, I wanted to ask something about the long-term business model for property development, because I, I, every time I see a business plan, I puzzle over it a little bit. Um, uh, without being in any way pejorative, I can see why um, property development seemed like a good idea because it was slightly opportunistic. You had, for example, the MOD site. Um, someone was going to develop that. I understand the line of reasoning that said, well, if someone's going to develop that, maybe it should be us because then we can do it the way we want to. And, and that's fine. I'm not arguing about that. But we can see from the figures that obviously you, you don't have line of sight into the distant future, which is why the revenue goes down because you haven't filled it up with new projects as yet. That I also understand, but this is why the overall mission, the strategy and the business model becomes so important because we need to understand where are you looking, what kinds of opportunities are you looking for? We see what regular developers do. What we can see is that on the whole, you have preferred to partner with CLTs 
and I'm not going to open that can of worms today. Um, but nevertheless, I, I just want to know, is, is that the plan going forward you, to, to do things that other property developers can't or won't do? Um, because at the moment, without a clear vision um, for the future, it is very difficult to understand where this company is going or what its right to exist actually is. Is in a couple of these flagship projects, I am struggling to see the added value that ECTC and Palace Green Homes has bought. You know, you have, for example, in Hadnam, okay, I mean, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the subject that you yourselves state as being the flagship uh, in many ways. I don't know what added value brought to them. They could have found a builder, so can other CLTs. There is a process for this. It's, they need advice and help, of course they do. But it doesn't have to come from a, a trading company owned by the council. So go back to the original statement. Next time you bring forward a vision, uh, uh, sorry, a business plan, I'd like to see what any other commercial entity does, which is a very robust statement of your right to exist and what it is you're doing that others can't do. And trust me, as someone who has seen so many of these, more than I, that I wish I had, what you have down here does not make the grade. It doesn't tell any of us what you actually stand for, or what you are, or what you're going to be doing three years, four years, five years from now, when the current projects are wrapped up and finishing off. We, we see a kind of struggle to define what you're going to be doing to, to bring in these revenue streams in the future. So sorry, slightly philosophical point. You don't have to have a pat answer for it now. I'm just saying this is something that it might be worth thinking about. It might be worth having a little workshop about at some point. Uh, I don't think that's a question. I think it's probably a statement that may want to be addressed in the debate. But um, we presented the business plan and we presented our financial case for the loan to council, which was approved. And um, I think we've stated where we are, uh, what the nature of those developments are, where we've added value. And I, I don't think it's only in terms of the individual projects, it's the wider contribution, both to the shareholder and to the wider community. And we feel very comfortable that on an ongoing basis, we're meeting both of those tests. But um, I don't think, and I don't think Councillor Harris was invited an answer, he's probably inviting reflection. Right, so if there's no further questions, we've had a proposal and seconded to approve the business plan. Now we now move to the debate. Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Yes, just one thing for me. I, I noted with surprise, I can't remember whether I've seen it before, this, this diagram on page four. Um, it's not a Venn diagram as such because the intersections are fairly meaningless. Uh, it's like a lot of local authority diagrams where you put a diagram in because you have to put a diagram in and it doesn't really tell us very much. But what it did tell me was some surprising things about the choice of words. I mean, it's one of the things, you know, you could do a word cloud on it and the kind of words that crop up are trade, profitable, taxpayer, commercial. There's absolutely nothing in here about building affordable homes. Nothing whatsoever. The word affordable doesn't crop up, not once in this diagram. And it's, you know, taxpayer. Well, who is a taxpayer? Um, most of us are taxpayers. Even people with no uh, income are taxpayers. Every time we go to the shop and buy most things other than food, probably, um, we're paying tax. We pay value added tax. We pay all sorts of other taxes. Um, and so unless you're talking about improving the quality of life of everybody but children, and rather strangely excluding children from the mix, I'm not sure what the word taxpayer means there, or why people who are taxpayers should be have the quality of their life improved at the benefit of anybody else who might, at the disbenefit of, of anybody else who might not be a taxpayer. It is a bizarre word to use. But 
it really struck me how deeply, deeply commercial this was and how deeply uninterested it was in the affordability of the product of the main thing it's there to do which is build homes and i think going back to the previous page the, the drivers um what are the drivers budget balancing the budget building new homes what sort of homes we don't know we don't care building homes devolution maxima getting getting the money um, and open for business in Kandabashi. There's the drivers, nothing to do with meeting the needs of, of residents. There are so many hundreds of residents, more than hundreds of residents, desperate for homes they can afford here. The only model that we've been promoting is these community land trusts. And as Councillor Harris has said, I'm not going to open that can of worms either. And then these first homes, which we will come on to later. But the, the model behind this was stark in this diagram. And it's about trade and business and profitability and taxpayers. And it's not about the needs of the people and the, the affordability of what we're doing. And I hadn't really clocked quite how blatant that was until I saw the uh, introduction on page three and particularly the diagram on page four and I just thought someone ought to say that. Councillor Bailey. Yeah thank you I'm just astonished to hear that the, 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 in yellow it literally says about meeting the needs of local people and businesses in East Cambridgeshire it literally says that Councillor Dupre's attack that it's not about meeting the needs of the local people it literally says that there. So I'm sorry she hasn't been able to read that or see it, but it, it does exactly say that. I make no apology uh, for what we set out to do in 2016 when we set up the trading company. We did that uh, on the back of uh, a firm commitment that we made to um, the, the people of East Cambridge here when we went out in a survey uh, as a group, our, our uh, group, uh, on this council and ask people what they wanted to see from us and how they wanted us to behave. It was at a time when uh, many local councils were in severe financial distress. Fortunately, for the good fortunes of this council and the careful management by our officers, we were not in that same position, but we didn't want to find ourselves in that same position. So we took steps to deal with that. And it happily, co well, unhappily in a way, coincided uh, with the issues that we've been facing as a district uh, around, uh, you know, delivery of new homes and delivery of new affordable homes. So, you know, we took the bull by the horns and tried to uh, deal with all of these issues. Uh, and I make absolutely no apology that we set out to be commercial. There is nothing wrong uh, with making uh, financial profit for this organization for a purpose and that purpose is absolutely clear and implicit it is stated in our corporate plan stated in our objectives and it is to deliver our corporate plan and my god has this organization delivered over the last few years we've delivered exactly what we set out to deliver uh, so I make no apology for that. We knew that we were facing a, an uncertain financial future and we took steps to deal with that situation. Uh, to, and, and, and we were very clear with our electorate that we would behave more commercially, uh, but within reason. We asked them, do you want us to behave more commercially? They said yes, but do it within reason. We know what they said because we asked them, and that's exactly what we've been doing. And we look for commercial uh, opportunities, but where we can deliver community benefit. And that is why it's so important for councillors to uh, have involvement and, uh, you know, close involvement in what goes on uh, with, with the trading company. We, the, the council is the 100% shareholder and the trading company is answerable to its shareholder. So I make no apology for that at all. Um, and if members of the opposition don't agree with that, that's, that's their right, of course. Uh, and they, they might do things differently, but, but we are clear with uh, the people that told us uh, how they wanted us to behave. Um, I want to say a massive congratulations to East Cambridge Trading Company. It's a lean organisation made up uh, of a, a very small uh, number of people uh, running it. Uh, the markets are, are an absolute jewel in the crown uh, of uh, East Cambridgeshire. People come from far and wide. We've done, the, the, the markets team have won national awards. They're turning a profit where before, uh, you know, this organisation uh, was to uh, some degree or other uh, propping up the, the, the running of the markets because it was seen as a, a good thing for the district. The markets are now 
plowing their own furrow and going absolutely from strength to strength, making their own new investments into their infrastructure uh, and their new business plan going forward and they're really delivering it's incredibly popular they have a bright vibrant uh, events calendar and they support this district hugely and we get huge numbers of people coming here because they exist and because of what they do and they've got big plans for the future and I wholeheartedly applaud them and I think it was the right thing to do to put them into the trading company and release them a bit <laughs> to, to go off and do what they've they've proven and done the open spaces is another case in point we've got fantastic uh, parks and open spaces uh, in this district uh, and they have delivered a cost reduction to this authority by providing their fantastic services to other organizations who are grateful for their services and very willing to continue paying for those because they recognize that they get a high quality service. That's resulted uh, in hundred thousand pounds per annum reduction to the cost of maintaining our parks and open spaces to the high standard that we do for this authority for our taxpayers. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we've been able to freeze the East Cam's element of council tax for the last year, nine years in a row, which was another thing that we promised people we would try to do. It's not the be all and end all, it's a modest amount of money, but it all helps, particularly in the current cost of living crisis where, and where other uh, upper tier authorities are increasing their council tax to the maximum possible amount available and putting half, over half of those funds into their own bank account. So uh, I, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm extremely proud of it. Um, I think if you look at um, Councillor Harry's asked uh, about what on earth is the added value. Well, if you start looking at the added value, and I think he was referring to Palace Green Homes in particular, uh, <laughs> Councillor Harris has often extolled the virtues of Haddenham CLT and the added values that have come out of Haddenham CLT and how wonderfully uh, it's been run. And I can tell him that Haddenham CLT has had very, very significant benefit uh, of the handholding of Palace and the expertise that exists in Palace Green Homes uh, around community led development and community land trust. Very, very significant support the whole way from start to finish, the public engagement, everything. Uh, and that is the, the, the added value that they bring uh, alongside a fantastically high quality development, low density, uh, beautiful outlook across Haddenham. I think it's a, a site to be incredibly proud of. Uh, the other, the added value of the MOD site, as um, Councillor Whelan alluded to, she said, yeah, it's great that we're delivering shared ownership homes. We wouldn't have got those shared ownership homes if a private developer had taken on that site. That is added value. Uh, it also, despite Councillor Harry's very disparaging comments to our NHS colleagues in the um, seminar that we had about it, uh, it was also helping to facilitate the uh, redevelopment of the hospital, uh, and that is coming into play uh, as, Sorry, as we Councilor speak. Baird, point of order. I did say it's great that the um, affordable homes are finally, well, affordable shared ownership homes are finally being delivered. I didn't, um, I wasn't praising for shared ownership, which I don't believe truly offer affordability. What I was praising was that after two years, finally people who want to buy those homes are able to do so, which is a very different thing. Once again, twisting my words. Well, I thank Councillor William for her clarification, but nonetheless, we are delivering 15 affordable homes on the MOD site that are highly unlikely to have been delivered uh, if a private developer had um, at, uh, purchase that, that site uh, and more new homes to, to come in the future sub, subject to, to planning applications and the like. So, uh, uh, and I think if you look at Barton Road, I think that's, uh, that's still of a considerable added value. There are two uh, affordable units there and a, and a financial contribution towards a third offsite affordable unit. Uh, and more than anything, uh, a beautiful high quality development showing other developers what can be done with a bit of imagination. I'm incredibly proud of it. Uh, the, 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 there's criticisms about not understanding what the vision for the future is. Well, I've read the business plan. I'm, I'm very clear on what East Cambridge Trading Company is focused on in the future. It is absolutely clearly set out there with the new projects that are coming forward. And of course, uh, we, we, the, the, the trading company is horizon scanning all the time, as it says in the document, and, and looking at other opportunities all of the time. Um, the, the Paradise site is in the business plan. Uh, the added value there is that we will be delivering uh, 100k homes, uh, which wouldn't have otherwise potentially, well, they would have been available because we were uh, requiring them under Section 106. But, um, you know, 
that, that is a significant um, added value that, that wouldn't uh, have been around if, if uh, this council hadn't behaved the, the, the way that it had done. Um, I think if you look at the, the SOAM site, uh, incredibly uh, high quality delivered by Palace Green Homes. So I'm really proud of all the things that we've done. The Kennett site going forward, that has been a community led development uh, through a properly formed democratic process. And although Councillor Harris likes to pretend that that is not the case, it absolutely is the case. And over half of the adult population is a member of the CLT. Uh, and the CLT had a properly formed, independently verified uh, referendum uh, that, that supported uh, moving ahead with, with the Kennett site. It's a fantastic development that's trying to show the way that high quality development can be, can be done. It's infrastructure first. It's the infrastructure that the community themselves chose and said was important to them. It's low density, it's high quality. It's gonna be near as damn it net zero. It's got large open spaces. Uh, proper facilities, community facilities on site, uh, new jobs coming forward, um, and uh, is, is absolutely a site to be proud of. And I think people will very much want to live there. And if you talk to the CLT about the efforts that they're making uh, to deliver the homes that they will, they will run uh, and or organise and run, that they're fantastic uh, and they're hugely committed. Um, we're running a lean organisation, I think, in East Cam's Trading Company. We staff it as is required, uh, particularly in Palace Green Homes. We have project teams that are uh, specific for particular projects, but happily uh, can be moved on to new projects and have delivered um, incredibly well. So, uh, and I think if you, uh, you know, this, apart from all of those uh, benefits, which are very considerable, new homes, new affordable homes, high quality homes, low density homes, new assets for um, communities that they own in perpetuity, that bring an income uh, into their village or community forever. Those are the benefits that are being delivered in part by uh, East Cam's trading company. They are very, very considerable indeed. But not least, if you look at page 11, uh, there is the information about uh, the financial benefit, which is uh, a not inconsiderable benefit to this organization. Uh, 3.6 million cumulative financial benefit to date, which is uh, um, forecast to rise to 4.7 million by the end of this, uh, by the end of 2023 financial year, uh, and follow the, the, the future three years going up to 6.5 million. That is money that would, this council would not have had the benefit of had we not set up East Cam's Trading Company, which I return to. What I said at the beginning was a very deliberate decision to help us deliver our corporate plan on our aims and objectives, and that is exactly what we've done. And, and East Cam's Trading Company has done every single thing that we asked of it. And, and I thank um, the, the, all of the directors involved, and, and particularly Paul, who sits there very quietly, but steers, steers the ship and has done since the beginning, um, and cares very much about uh, how the trading company delivers and, and, and I hope is as proud of it as we are. I think, we, I think there was a fantastic annual report last time and I very much look forward to seeing the new annual report this time. So for me, that's, that's why we've been doing it. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Hunt. Yes, Chair, I, um, I think there seems to be a certain amount of confusion between Councillor Bailey's point of view and Councillor Dupre's. I've been watching Councillor Dupre and she's clearly got something much more fascinating to listen to on her machine, which she's been playing with and concentrating on throughout Councillor Bailey's explanation. I find it really quite discourteous and uh, not very professional, but it does make me believe why she doesn't see the things because she doesn't listen when things are being explained to her. So I just wish she would listen. And actually she could be little less confused because in her speech just recently when I was listening to it, um, she said that, uh, first of all, uh, we only benefited the taxpayers, but she'd previously said that everybody was a taxpayer, even the children who bought uh, sweets and paid VAT. So I think she ought to clarify it at some stage, not tonight, but when she's got a time off from her mechanical exercises uh, to uh, find out and decide what her point of view is. At the moment, it seems to be just disagree with whatever we say. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody.
I am now moving to the recommendation where we are requested to approve the ECT's business plan. All those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. The recommendation is carried by seven votes to four. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, John. Thank you, Paul. We now move to agenda item number eight, which is the Economic Development Service Delivery Plan. We can I ask Martin Smith to come forward and introduce this item, please? Welcome. Sorry, could you put your microphone on, please? Is that okay? okay thank Thanks. Sorry, I'm bringing to council this evening the uh, a request to the members to approve the economic development plan for the economic. Uh, <coughs> Um, we provided papers, but I would just like to draw attention to a few things. Um, firstly, the plan in itself um, is a new plan. We're not updating a previous plan because one hasn't been done for quite some time. Uh, the reason it's a new plan also is I took on the, the mantle of becoming uh, the service lead uh, last year. And as part of that, I did... Uh, at, um, at the request of the council, a review of the uh, of the service, and um, that was a very interesting and quite um, uh, valuable exercise. So the plan that we've provided um, and we're now working to, um, obviously, is actually something that reflects the kind of review that I did, uh, the restructure of what we're doing within the department, and also. I'd just like to bring a few key issues that might be of interest to the members before I, uh, before I put it back. Uh, firstly, the plan itself, um, as I said, was born out of doing a review. And one of the things I found difficult about reviewing the economic development function within the council was the data that was available to the council in terms of what the district actually does or you know, what it actually means within the district. So how many businesses, what those businesses do, um, effectively, what is it we're playing with as an economy? Our, our, our single source for that sort of information comes typically from government or national statistics or combined authority. Um, I've actually worked in economic development within the council for several years now and on the ground, talking to businesses and con connecting with those businesses, I see quite different, a, a quite different environment. So it's always quite difficult to connect um, what we see in, 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 you know, on the ground and also what we are told the statistics should reflect. So the first thing I've kind of done within the service delivery plan and I'm highlighting is the fact that we are to have commission, commission to study um, the objective of that study really was about understanding an evidence-based kind of review of what the district looks like, feels like, and so forth. I say evidence-based because, again, I, I, I didn't personally want to bias any of that with my, my views and what I see. So the evidence-based, um, again, was, is being conducted by an independent review, and that is due for completion during the summer. So we, we're not quite there yet in terms of being absolutely what we can provide, but that's one thing I would draw your attention to. I think in terms of priorities for economic development team, my second point really is that we are kind of the go-between between what goes on within the council and what goes on in the economy and with, with businesses and stakeholders within the business. So in terms of timetables and priorities, we're kind of driven by those kind of external forces that kind of... Um, come before us. So what we do, what I would say, however, is there are three kind of things within this plan that we are kind of laser focused on, if you like. The first being that study and getting that sorted. Um, the second is a priority within the corporate plan, which is around skills and um, employment. So we're trying to develop a, plat a, a kind of a, if you like, a tactical plan that runs for the for the local authority and develop that so that we actually are aligned with the combined authority who are effectively hold the um, portfolio for education and the purse strings. And thirdly, 
one of the things that is always underestimated and has been and has been flagged already within the, um, the independent study that we're doing is around digital and the, the actual sort of importance of um, access, access to digital and all that sort of thing. So those are the three things that we're kind of focused on and that is kind of the backbone of a lot of the work that we are engaged with. Thank you, Martin. Members, we are requested to approve the, the Economic Development Service Delivery Plan, and I will propose that we do so. Do I have a second there? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ambrose Smith. Members, uh, we move to comments and questions. Again, Councillor Whelan, thank you for the questions that you submitted on behalf of your group. Um, do the answers satisfy you, and are there, are there further questions? So, Councillor Dupre. Thank you. They are questions from our group and therefore it may not necessarily be one person who wants to pick them up. Um, they are collective. Yes, um, I did say on behalf of the group. So I just wanted to follow up on, on the questions here. The first one was um, about the extent of the service's ambition for electric vehicle charging points. Um, I mean, one of the um, noticeable things about uh, electric vehicles is that there's been huge demand from the public for electric vehicles, which has not been matched by availability of electric vehicles for various reasons, but also not been matched by the development of the necessary infrastructure. Um, and I'm not clear from the answer to the question what we're talking about here. Uh, we've got so few in East Cambridgeshire at the moment, pitifully few. Uh, we've got quite a lot that don't actually uh, work, aren't functioning. Um, we've got an answer to the, uh, the, the to a freedom of information request which I've seen recently, which said that the council isn't going to put anything in its own premises because we won't be paid a hundred percent grant to do it. Um, so there's not really any evidence. There's no, clar there's no clarity in the answer of how far we want to go with this, where we're working, what kind of volume we're talking about and how we envisage playing our part in meeting that, that shortfall in, in demand for EV charging points. Um, on the second, that's the first, that's the first follow-up question. The second follow-up question is the working with communities. Uh, and thank you for the answer. That's very interesting and useful. And I'm pleased to see that the economic development team is doing all of those things. Um, it mentions the city, uh, city of Ely Council and town councils. It doesn't mention the more rural areas. Do you have any engagement at all with communities in rural areas? And do you see your service as having any role in that? Is, is, economic, is this economic development for business communities or economic development for community communities? Um, and finally, um, the occupancy rates. I'm delighted to see that the occupancy rate of East Space North and East Space South is 100%, that's brilliant. So why are we targeting 80% and why are we expecting potentially a 20% drop in, in the occupation of e-space. Thank you, Chairman. I think I'll take the first question, Councillor Dupre, and then hand over to Martin to take the second and the third questions. I think to be fair to the Economic Development Service, the electoral charge report has not been a function of economic development, but rather it's something that they were able to contribute towards during the Climate Action Plan. So it's not a, a stated aim of the economic development function, which is why you don't see it come through the actual service plan. So Sally will work with um, all across all service areas uh, to deliver that. So it's a specific action within the current Climate Action Plan, which econ economic development were able to lend a hand in. And it started with Nick Lancaster when he worked under the infrastructure arm and carried across. So it's not a specific function of the economic development. And I'm sorry that wasn't clear in the response that we provided to you, Councillor Dupre. I'll now hand over to Martin to talk about the community element and whether or not parish councils, parishes are involved in that. And also the question about the occupancy. Thank you. Could you put your microphone on, please, Martin? I'll get it in the end. Um, so on the community aspect, um, Council, we, we um, don't directly, um, I'll be open with that, but indirectly we kind of do. Um, 
as an example, I work with Lewis Badger's team on various things, particularly where he's looking for some funding, which that's very current actually in, in another respect um, for, for initiatives and that sort of thing. So indirect, indirectly, yes, but directly, no. Um, on the occupancy rates, um, why 80%? Um, we have to keep the centres at 80% effectively to break even, not cost the council. If that makes sense. So we, we, we target ourselves, and I don't think in the last, well, certainly in the seven years I've been involved, we've actually been in that position, but I'd have to check, but we, I don't think we have. Thank you. Councillor Ambrose Smith. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I do actually think you do uh, a debate, sorry. Uh, you do talk to uh, parish council and so forth. I have a concern. As much as I support this, I support your work and you've, what you've done to date, let alone what we plan to do going forward. Very much support it. What I have concerned with is, is risk management. I think the three line statement, which is in there, is not enough. It needs to be expanded on. We need a matrix of the, what, is, what the concerns are going forward. Uh, for example, one of our... Uh, can, the example I have here is, uh, can the uh, combined authority be considered a reliable partner? Uh, I appreciate the CAP uh, has revised its skills and uh, employment strategy. That's good, very positive indeed. Uh, and it can be seen as a good part of this uh, structure we've got going forward. But uh, the governance of the uh, combined authority is currently uh, uh, negatively affected by senior pers personnel leaving the organization. And uh, with government funding in some, on some projects being taken away and uh, uh, some actually being given back, I have a concern going forward. Will the uh, CPA be able to help ECDC's economic development plan for the long haul? I would like to have seen uh, a six monthly review of the risks especially in this first year, uh, if you could lay those out, uh, if that's possible. But th that's just me, me asking those questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be agreed. And I'd be interested in the, I'm sure that will be defined by the independent review you're talking about as well. So uh, you can't do it immediately. Okay, thank you. So the, the question was around risk management and expanding that. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Chairman. Um, this um, the service delivery plan reflects all other service delivery plans. Risks are specifically managed within the service. They're not, they're not formed into a risk management plan that comes for members. That's not the practice that we do here. Um, it's not one that we were looking to introduce. It's for the service manager to manage his risks. I do note the comments you make about the combined authority's ability to enable us to deliver some of the parts of our service and where we find that they don't come forward and don't come to fruition. At that point, they are reported to members. So I think... In terms of individual risk registers for service areas, they don't tend to come before committee. Service managers manage their risks and they escalate in accordance with our risk management policy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Grant. Councillor Trapp. Yes, I have a question about the digital infrastructure. It says increase the availability of gigabit capable, capable broadband to premises in the district. What do you mean by premises? Villages, offices, this to be a digital work first there we go um yeah so i actually sit on the um board of the connecting cambridgeshire um so the county council have connecting cambridgeshire responsible for that side of things um so what we what we are looking at when i first came into this role um broadband was a real issue across all the villages and um within the district um and the uptake and the delivery to homes and buildings and premises and communities was quite poor. Um, having worked with Connecting Cambridgeshire, we've managed to kind of prioritize a lot of that and, and, and change a lot of that. And we are now, you know, in the high 90s in terms of fast broadband into the, into the home, 90%. So the penetration has changed. Gigabit is, a sorry, the gigabit aspect of it is now going to the next level. And already we're starting to see people at, with, within homes and that sort of thing, um, able to get very high speed and very high. Uh, and I don't want to get too technical here, but I mean, we are we are seeing um, this this district keep up. And in some cases, I think South Cams were ahead of in terms of penetration as well. So when I talk about when we talk about premises, we're talking about across the 
peace, businesses, homes, villages, and that sort of thing. Can I follow up? Because I know there's a lot of, in my ward, there's a lot of people, well, not a lot, but some people are signing up to something like Cambridge Fibre. Is that the alternative to getting good broadband that we can't supply in the district? I don't know Cambridge Fibre. It's not one that's on my radar, I'm afraid. <laughs> as a pro as presumably a private yeah, provider. A private provider. But yeah. they're having to sign up there, which is quite costly because there's no adequate broadband in the villages. In the, in the southwest. Councillor Harris. Oh, he, he did wave at me. Sorry, I hypnotised myself there. <laughs> um, literally, I, I, I'm really interested in how um, how you actually interact with the organisations that are actually delivering uh, as full. Disclosure, I work a lot with 5G specialists, with power grid specialists, with communication grid specialists in a number of European countries. So you can be as technical as you like. What really interests me is that when you say you're sitting on connected Cambridge, we know who actually sends the van out, vans out to make the connections to make sure it actually works. And I know what their business plan is and they're normally blithely unconcerned about what any local council thinks that it wants. So just talk me through the actual mechanisms, the relationship, and how you are able to influence these behemoths to do things slightly differently. That, so the, the, the council is not in a position to deal with those, those, those big players because I've tried. Um, they're disinterested because of their scale and, sc and scope, which is why we directly work with Connecting Cambridgeshire. Um, so the, t the team at Connecting Cambridgeshire obviously have the gravity of the combined authority and all that sort of thing behind them. And that is practically the way that we connect to those players. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Oh, Councillor Dubray. Sorry, yes, um, I was a bit fixated on the phrase the gravity of the combined authority in the current circumstances, but there we go, I'll let that pass. Um, yeah, um, a, a couple of months ago, um, we had a man with a van, um, well, two men with a van, <clears throat> turn up outside our house um, and start doing stuff in the road. And we said, oh, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're connect, um, connect fibre and we are here to cable up. The street right okay does that mean fiber to the premises yes it does great so they were doing stuff all the way through the village and uh, and then we started getting you know adverts about how much to pay um and then yesterday i was going somewhere i turned out the hard standing turned up to the junction with the main street and there was a man with a van and uh it said <clears throat> open reach on the side and i said oh what are you doing and he said, oh, we're here to cable up your street. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. So does that mean that my uh, that with my current supplier, without having chain to change to connect fiber, I can sign on to this new service? Um, you know, will, will they be able, as it's open reach, to use fiber? And he said, I don't know. And uh, he said, but there's been, an, you know, having to follow around on Connect Fiber and the stuff that they've done has sort of, you know, been relating, you know, interfering, I suppose. I can't remember the exact word he used, but I don't think he was terribly happy about the impact of Connect Fiber's bits of cable with OpenReach's bits of cable. And then there was somebody else that we heard of, another firm who was, oh, we'd like to come and cable up Sutton. Um, and I know that there was a decision made a long time ago under a previous government that all of this would be thrown open to the wonders of competition. But I think if, if it's got to be a question, I think my question is, do you despair as much as I do about the inability of organisations to be able to work together and the inability of sectors like the county council and uh, the combined authority to actually get a proper handle on who's doing everything so we don't have everybody coming at fortnightly interviews intervals cabling up our streets i think that might be a slightly unfair 
question of Martin to answer. Councillor, you pray. Um, I think we're trying to work with all the organisations and Martin works very hard to make sure that all the organisations are, are aware of our situation and understanding and trying to get what we can for the district. I think that's as far as can reasonably be expected as an answer. Thank you. Right, thank you. Members, we're now moving to the debate as to whether we approve the service delivery plan. Do we need to debate it much or can we just have a show of hands? All in favour? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Well done. Yes, you, yeah, sit, sit tight. <laughs> Which brings us on to agenda item number nine, the levelling up fund bid. Martin, over, you, over to you to introduce the item, please. Mike, Martin. Mike. Microphone. So I'll try and keep the introduction a little bit briefer this time. Um, I guess you've read some of the papers that have come through. Um, what we're seeking here is permission to submit a bid to the levelling up fund. Uh, just to remind you that the levelling up fund is part of a government um, um, initiative, a 4.8 billion fund nationally. Uh, we're not applying for that much money, obviously. Um, the fund itself allows us to make a bid for, um, it, it's kind of cri cri criteria really falls to um, areas of um, I think they described as improve everyday life and infrastructure and that sort of thing. And the three pillars of that fall on local transport projects, culture and heritage and town regeneration projects. Um, I came to this um, about three months ago with an ask, have we got something we can put a bid towards that will be um, both credible and uh, meet, the meet all the criteria? I said, of course, and then read the actual prospectus, which is very complicated and um, became quickly apparent that we would need ex external help to make that bid. Um, I can report to members that we have until the 6th of July to deliver um, the bid in its entirety. Um, the reason that we have chosen the project, um, the project will be at Littleport. Um, the reason we have chosen that is born out of several factors. Uh, number one, um, the report that we I mentioned in the previous section for the study that we're doing highlighted um, many criteria that Little Port um, fits. Uh, things like deprivation and all that sort of thing within our district is um, an issue in that area. Secondly, it kind of clicked in with the um, the Vision 2030, which um, was effectively the master plan for Little Port. And it, again, it also clicked in with um, things that we felt we could tick the boxes on throughout the entire uh, levelling up fund bid. The bid itself is um, what we're calling a hybrid bid, and it connects effectively with two priorities within all the, within all the sectors, um, of all the boxes we have to tick. One is around commercial space and improving the commercial aspect uh, or, and the district itself is very short of that space uh, as well as little port and we also can make um, a claim a make make a pitch as well within the bid for the other two areas which is uh, town regeneration and cultural and heritage um, as part of a, a development of the site that's the overview um, I, 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 I can add more in the questions perhaps thank you martin I have a proposal in second of the recommendation that we uh, approve the submission of a levelling up round two fund bid. Happy to propose. propose Chair. Thank you, Councillor Northwith. Second day. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Uh, members, uh, questions for Martin? Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Um, I didn't submit this question in advance because I was waiting to see if I could get hold of a map of the cycle route that is uh, mentioned at 3.4 and uh, just to see if I was wrong. And I received a copy of that map late this afternoon, which I understand is work in progress. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, the final thing because I wasn't told it was the final thing, but I was struggling a bit with the reasoning for this cycle route linking Little Port Station with the town and over to the A10 Wisbeach Road BP garage. And the obvious question is what then? Um, the, the map showed, um, in the top left-hand corner of the map, um, East Base North, and that's mentioned in the bid. But if you're talking about connecting 
the station, the town, and eSpace North by cycle, then that's great. But what you've then got is a repeat further up the A10 of the BP roundabout situation, because you are going to have, and I can see this coming, people coming out of the woodwork and saying, oh, there's a lot more business here now. We must amend the roundabout to make it much, much faster for cars. And forgetting that included in this must be a safe crossing for cyclists and potentially pedestrians as well to get to East Space North. So if the aim is to connect, connect this to East Space North, then I don't understand what the plan is for getting across that busy roundabout. And if it isn't to connect it to East Space North, then what is the purpose of just dumping cyclists at the edge of a roundabout? And I'm struggling a bit with that map and with the intention behind the, the active travel component of this bid. Okay, thank you. I think uh, a couple of points really. Firstly, um, the roundabout is part of the work in progress. We are working with highways um, at county. So um, throughout, the build, if you like, of this bid. We have worked with uh, the highways team. Um, and again, you know, it, it, it's not just that aspect, it's, it's the entire route that we're looking at at the moment as to how that connects. It is an integral part of it. And we wanna get that right and have no weaknesses in that proposition when we go with the final bid. Councillor Ambrose Smith. I just wondered if I could help at all. Can I help clar clarify? Uh, the, 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 the pathway, the cycleway goes past the school, the new school, so it gives you access to that, the students' access to that. Uh, and then going, going to the East Space North, it's not just East Space North, there's 22 other, 27 other companies on that industrial estate on the other side of the road, 27, with employing over 200 people. So that's, that's, that. Uh, from oh, once you get over the roundabout, there's 200. Yeah, well, you've got to get there somehow, and uh, if we can get a cycle route, so I've answered the question. I, I hopefully helped you to say that there is something there other than other than <coughs> East Space North, and and there is also on route there is a school which in, which has 576 pupils there. Uh, that's the secondary school. Doesn't include the send. A, a school and it doesn't include the preschool either so, uh, so it's, it's a big big it's a big ask this has been it's taken hours hundreds of hours of councillors work behind the scenes to actually get this on get this on a plan so uh, just to just to well, i know it's debate but i'm trying to educate Thank you. I, mean, I think that was directed at me. So yes, I'm, acu I'm, I'm, I'm acutely aware of all those businesses. My, my county division, of course, right, ends on, at on, the, at the final, on, just before the on. final house on Blackburn. We're getting so, to the yeah. debate here. Is there any further questions from Martin? No. Councillor Hunt. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm all right in thinking Councillor Ambrose Smith has, has mentioned most of the things that are in my mind. But the um, a cycle route from the station would also encompass the leisure centre, wouldn't it? Or is that a yes or no? Yes. It's a yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Right, members, we've got proposal and seconder that we approve the submission of a, a bid as outlined in here. Over to the debate. Councillor Harris. Um, I just want to say that no proposal is ever perfect, but Littleport needs the investment. If it's possible to get funds to put into this project, then the very best of luck. I know, I know how much people have worked on this, and um, you definitely get my vote and all best wishes, and I hope it goes well. Right. Sorry, Councillor Dupre. Yes, in case there was any suggestions I wasn't supportive of this, I have to say I will be voting for 
for it, and I, I'm very supportive indeed of uh, active travel for all of the reasons that Councillor Ambrose Smith has mentioned in terms of venues along the route. It is the question of either dumping people at the roundabout or the lack of provision to enable them to cross that concerns me to get to all those facilities, businesses, and so on that I know so well on the west side of the roundabout. And that's that's my concern is that we, we you know I don't want us to see. It. I don't want to see us do half a job and then end up in the position we've got with BP with, with uh, you know, years of inadequate provision for crossing the road. That's the, it. the answer that Martin gave earlier on indicated to me that that work is ongoing with the County Council Highways. So. Right, all those in favour, please show. Oh, sorry, Councillor Ambrose Smith. Quick. Thank you. All right. That moves us on to agenda item number 10, uh, first homes interim policy statement. Before I ask Sally to introduce this, members, I'm conscious we've been going for nearly two hours now. I am proposing that we take a short comfort break at half past six. I'm just giving Karen advance notice so that we she, she's ready for it for the, uh, for the live stream, if that's okay with everybody. Sally, over to you. Thank you, Chair. This report outlines the proposed approach to delivering first homes in East Cambridgeshire. First homes are discounted market sale housing and are defined as affordable housing. The discount on the properties is available in perpetuity. The report sets out how first homes will be secured in relation to other forms of affordable housing and also proposes some local connection criteria in addition to the national eligibility criteria. The role of the council is not to allocate first homes, but to secure them via a section 106 agreement and check that an applicant meets the relevant eligibility criteria. Thank you, Sally. Can I have a proposal and second of the recommendations that we approve the first homes interim policy statement, please? Yes, very much like to propose it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Second day. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Members, uh, We've had one question in advance. Can I just check with the Liberal Democrat group that they are satisfied with the answer? Councillor Dupre. Thank you. The answer, this is about the uh, equalities implications of the proposed local connection test. And the answer says that uh, based on uh, whatever, uh, a judgment was made on whether there is the potential for the criteria to result in unlawful discrimination or a less favorable impact on any group in the community. Um, could I see, uh, not, not, <clears throat> not now obviously, but could I see a copy of the documentation relating to how that judgment was arrived at and by whom and on what basis? Request noted. Are there any further questions for Sally? If not, we move to the debate, members. Nobody's indicating. Oh, I mean, sorry, I'll just say, just say a few words in proposing it, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that, you know, I, it, when First Homes first came out, I thought it was, you know, it was muted as being an absolute requirement. Uh, as ever, the devil is in the detail. Um, and until we've got this uh, firmly embedded in our local plan, uh, you know, it clearly can't be an actual requirement. But I think, you know, everything that this council can do to encourage the, the larger scale developers to um, be positive about about this, I think, will be helpful. And I think, you know, as well, it's worth noting that, uh, you know, if if, if uh, first homes do form part of the mix of the affordable housing element, that you know, um, up to the, the the remainder should be, um, you know, earmarked for affordable rent. And, and uh, I think, you know, that makes for uh, a good mix. Um, and I'm really pleased to see this coming forward and effectively taking over where 100k homes left off really thank you thank you Councillor. yes i thank you chair 
I find it quite flattering to East Cams that uh, central government have basically followed our hundred thousand uh, pounds home plan and uh, they're, 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 they're just deviating a little bit from our plans to so they can pretend that it's their own ideas. But uh, so, yes, I would be certainly supporting this and uh, we can do no more than encourage it. And any way we can get people into uh, a, a do, good quality home has to be encouraged and people are different, their needs are different, their finances are different, their incomes are different and the more options we have, the better. Uh, and we want to see this place flourishing and uh, people with proper homes to live in. So I'm fully in favour of this. Thank you. Right. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Abstentions. Thank you. Brings us on to agenda item number 11, the growth and infrastructure fund criteria. Sally, can I ask you to introduce this one as well, please? This report details proposed eligibility criteria for the growth and infrastructure fund. Members agree the fund will open for applications from the 11th of July until the 7th of October. Applications will be assessed by a member panel as per the proposed terms of reference at Appendix 2, and their recommendations will be presented to the November meeting of this committee. Thank you. Can I have a proposal and seconder for the recommendations? We have four recommendations on this one. So approve the screen scheme criteria, agree the fund opening date and closing date, agree the panel terms of reference and to appoint seven members. I will give the names of the Conservative group in the debate stage. Can I have a proposal and a seconder, please? Happy to propose, Chair. Thank you. Seconder. Happy Thank to propose, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Second, Lampard. rather. Thank you, Councillor. Second, got carried away. <laughs> Members, any comments or questions for Sally on this item? Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Yes, I have a question about the operation of um, the receipt of applications for this fund. We're told here that the fund will be opened on the 11th of July and close on the 7th of October. And we've been told in Sally's introduction of the item that the recommendations of this panel that are being set up will go to the November meeting of this committee. I don't therefore understand how the fund can be fully utilised before the close date if those recommendations have not been presented to members because it is entirely possible i would have thought it may not be likely but it is possible that the panel may make some recommendations that the committee might disagree with some of the recommendations and then you will have deterred applications between the 7th of october and the end of november but still have money spare uh, and you won't be able to make a judgment about whether the applications you've deterred would have been better than the ones that you've been presented with because you haven't seen them because you've told people it's full even though it won't have been by the end of November. It seems to me that you, you can't declare a fund closed to applications until you know that what you're proposing has actually been agreed by the parent committee that the panel will be referring them to for approval. So I don't get the timeline at all. Through you, Chairman. I think at some point you have to draw a line on when you stop receiving applications so you can determine when the application can go to the relevant committee. What we're not seeking to do is say, right, that's it, no more. So we didn't spend all the money, so it goes back into some general pot. That's not the case here. We can always reopen the fund and we can tell people, subject to, your application will be held in abeyance. So we can we can take all of those actions, but at some point you do have to draw a line on when you stop receiving applications. It enables people to focus and we'll know pretty early on if we haven't had applications to fully utilize that fund, 
then we'll be able to go straight back out because I would imagine, not to speak for Sally, but the November committee could say, right, straight back out to Adbo and it'll come through as part of that recommendation. So we're not looking to say, this is the line in the sand, no more, no more shall cross. So it's just going to be a case of see how it goes beyond October and reopen it as necessary. It does say in the, uh, in the appendix one, if not all of the funding is allocated, the further application round will be held. Chair, yes, if I can just come back though, that's a perfectly normal process. You set a deadline, people meet the deadline. If they don't meet the deadline, they're told, I'm sorry, you haven't met the deadline, but that's different to closing the fund. I think just for clarity, we're not looking to close the fund. I think it's just language. So let, we, we'll tidy that up, Councillor Dupre, because it's not the intention that we close the fund. It's purely language, and the, the wrong language has been used in the report. I assure you, it's not about closing the fund. Thank you. It's closing for applications, as well. Right. Um, if there's no further, any further questions, Councillor Trapp. Um, yeah, I do have questions about that. So what we're saying really is that um, applications will be received. They'll be saying, oh, yes, this is fine. So the earlier one sends in an application, it seems to me, the easier it may be to get the grant. Whereas I would have thought one would be actually slightly more competitive and say, well, applications received during that whole period because it takes some time to put forward an application that we ought to be actually grading them at the end the committee that is coming up this mem members of the growth and structure plan should be debating the um value the the um what, what the value of these uh, applications are and then making a decision based on that and then recommending it to the member yeah. But to just to say we're going to cut it off because we've just up, got up to two million, is I something wrong with that? Can I suggest a, a minor amendment to number for a little two, then, Chairman, to say that agree that the applications for the fund will be opened from Monday, the 11th of July, and the applications for the fund will close on Friday, the 7th of October. And, and that will tidy it up, Chairman. So that's effectively deleting the second part of that, deleting the words in the event that onwards. Is that right? I, I totally get what everybody's saying, although I think Councillor Trapp was making a slightly different point, if I may say, uh, and seemed to be suggesting there might be an endless pot of money. There is only £2 million pounds in the fund um, as, as allocated in our budget. Um, and I think one of the reasons for having rounds is to focus people's mind. You know, we don't want to leave it open endlessly. We want to get this money out the door and benefiting our communities, don't we? So um, I fully support the idea of having rounds. And it is a fairly large window. And we did announce this fund in February. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, uh, working to promote it through the comms team that, you know, that it's coming and that it's available. And we did do announcements around that. Um, and obviously, as well, you know, if the fund, if and when the fund is fully utilised, um, there is still uh, other forms of funding. So for leisure centres and sports centres, uh, recreational facilities, there's uh, the new money that we put into the budget for them. And also there's our community infrastructure list as well. But I, I wanted to uh, propose hopefully a helpful amendment. Um, so I was going to suggest that Little Two says agree that the fund will be opened on Monday, the 11th of July 2022. Um, and closure of the first round will be on Friday, the 7th of October, 2022, in the event that the fund is fully utilised before the final close date, the council reserves the right to close the fund depending on new applications. Because that deals with, the, basically what we are saying is, you know, there is a, a, a reservation right in there to close the fund if it's not all utilised before it's utilised and that I think is probably quite important to keep that in there if we're not getting enough enough bids coming forward. I don't know if that helps or not. That's a trap. Okay, yeah. So will this these members, the growth and infrastructure panel, then meet on 7th or not 7th of October, but just early in October after that, and then decide on all the applications. Yeah. Okay, uh, having before that met and decided on some kind of criteria. So it's like everything, so 7th of October is a final date. There may be extended depending on how much is. 
Dep exactly. Depending yeah, exactly. on the yeah. So the the first the, so the first round will be this. Were there to be further money, I, I'm quite. I know there's only two million pounds. You know, I know just so such a small amount. You know, in the context. Um, I know, so the further rounds maybe depending on what the outcome is of the first round. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. So so can we try? Yes. So but a bear of little brain, you see, you know, needs needs that, that sort of simplistic approach, you know, the Winnie the Pooh, the sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify with the council track that the criteria is being agreed by committee today. It won't be for the working group to set the criteria. I just wanted to, to put that point across because you said that they'll meet to agree the criteria. No, it's it's going to be agreed if members approve it today. So, Councillor Dupree. Yeah, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm glad that there's a recognition that the wording is wrong, but I still think it's not right. My, I would have thought that a better way to express this would be to agree that the fund will be opened on the 11th of July and closed on the 7th of October. So, could, could I suggest that it needs to be opened for applications and closed to applications? Yeah, fine. If you want, adding those words is totally fine by me. But but it's really the second part needs to be expressed the other way around. In the event the <clears throat> in the event that the fund is not fully utilised after the committee has approved the successful bids, the council reserves the right to open the fund to fresh applications. Surely, that seems that that's the way things are normally done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I read out what I've got, then yeah. yeah, and then that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if I read out what I've got, it's asking for going equal to or now to become agreed that the fund will open for applications on Monday, the 11th of July 2022, and closed for applications. The first round of applications on 7th of October, and the council reserves the right to close the fund in the event of it being fully utilised or reopen in the event of it not being fully utilised. Is that? Or I'll just add, reopen to a further round in the event of yeah, not being fully yeah, yeah. yeah. Chair, I, th I thought the vaguer option was actually the better, if you're not going to adopt my I, words. I, I think that we're getting somewhere with this. Yeah, it, yeah, I think yeah, what we now have, isn't it, is, if I'm correct, a proposal that in the event that the fund is fully utilised before the committee has made its determination, well, I don't see how that can happen. Uh, I've That's been taken I've, out. That's already been taken out. Yeah. Right. But Sorry, you said something about the... No. the, the, the can you read it again? Okay, I'll read it again. Agree that the fund be open to applications on Monday the 11th of July 2022 and close to applications on the first round applications on 7th of October 2022 and the council reserves the right to fund to close the fund in the event that it is fully utilised or reopened to a further, oh, well, no, because you've said that not adding or reopened in the event of not being fully utilised. So you're giving yourself maximum flexibility that way. So we've taken out that bit about the closed thing. Yeah. I kind of have problems with that because it, it, it says first round as if there's an assumption that there are going to be more rounds than there might not be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think reserving the right to close the fund if it's all used up is a bit odd because that's kind of an, so obvious it barely needs saying. Okay, so it should perhaps say in the event, in the event that the fund isn't used, we reserve the right to reopen the application. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. I think we both have a more Thank you. 
Is it better? I don't know. Yeah. Not really running that. Sure. That's, that's my own daughter saying, right? Yeah, that's fine. It's like, take that up. So, that's amazing. It's okay. So, we've now got the degree that the fund will be open for applications on Monday, the 11th of July, 2022. Yes. And it closed on 7th of October. And the council reserves the right to reopen for further grounds with us in brackets in the event that the fund is not renewed. I thought I thought we got the first sentence sussed actually. It's, it's the one point of clarity we, in a shifting world. Can I, can I propose a second of that uh, amendment quickly? Thank you. Thank you. So, right. Where does it go? Yeah. Right. Um, we, we, we're, we're still actually on questions at this stage. And, and we can't go to the vote because we haven't given our names yet. But I can put forward the names from the Conservative group of councillors, well, of myself, and then Councillor Liz Every. Councillor Dan Schumann and Councillor Joe Weber. There's our four members to sit on the panel. If, if did the Liberal Democrats have their names? Yeah, we've got so Councillor Norma Dupre and Councillor John Trump, please. Thank you. Councillor Austin, do we have a name from the for the independent group? Yes, um, Thank you. Right. Do we need any further debate or can we go to the vote? Go to the vote. All in favour, please show. Thank you. It's unanimous. It's unanimous. Right. So can I propose we have just have a five minute comfort break?
Right, members, can we uh, reconvene with agenda item 12, 12? I will point out to members that we are halfway through the agenda, so, but we will crack on. Agenda item 12 is the financial outturn report for 21-22. On reflection, this item should have been further down the agenda as an item to note, for that I, I apologise. But since the agenda has been published, we will take the item now and can ask Ian to Ian Smith to introduce the item. Thank you, Chair. The Council have had a net underspend in 2122 of 2.36 million on revenue and 4.28 million on capital. Explanations of the major under and overspends on revenue and capital are contained within the narrative report. The underspend on revenue has been moved into the certain savings reserve. The committee will be asked to approve the carry forward of some of the capital underspends when reviewing their first financial report for the 22-23 financial year. The committee is asked to note the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. I will propose the recommendation to note from the Chair. Can I have a second, Abby, to uh, second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bobbington. Uh, right, we have a few questions submitted in advance. As I said earlier on, they, these will be included in the minutes. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Councillor Whelan, are you satisfied with the replies received? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I just you know, tremendously struggled with the um, second of questions on those items in particular. Um, you know, where we're talking about um, you know, the fact that obviously the majority of these variances are related to staff, or I should say lower levels of staff than were originally budgeted. And obviously, you know, we then, you know, there is clearly vacancies that um, are not being filled. Um, and I appreciate it always takes a little time to fill vacancy, and often people are leaving before. Um, but I'm really concerned here um, that this, you know, there are all sorts of implications around, you know, delays and staff morale and everything else. And it really worries me that, you know, what we're seeing is, yes, there's a good cash saving from it, but actually we really need to have the people here doing the job and able to do the job. Certainly one, you know, one or two of the queries I've had from constituents has been around um, problems with actually getting responses to things. Are we really satisfied that, you know, we should be seeing this as a positive thing or as actually a negative thing, having these, you know, so, you know such a positive variance on staff costs. Through you, Chairman, um, I think there was a, a question in there as, as to how that's viewed. So it's just incidental that there is a saving on variances. It's not, you know, it's not the, we don't set out to achieve a saving on staff. I think it's important to, to, to set that on straight. We do work with, as a corporate management team, we work with all of our service managers to ensure that vacancies are filled. We don't take vacancies away when they arise. We most are replaced on a like flight basis, but they, we do struggle to recruit sometimes because some of these vacancies do take a while to fill. If we come back and we've not been successful, we then look at them again to see, are we targeting the right audience? And then we come back and we go out again. We don't always recruit like for like because sometimes there's a bit of change in the service in the year, depending on the post. So you look at it as an opportunity. Is this time now time to change the post to make sure it's fit for purpose? So the management team and the service managers and anyone looking to go through the recruitment process always ask these questions as they go through. We do not hold back any posts in order to make savings or anything like that. We budget for a full complement of staff all year round, which has always been the standard practice of this authority and we do try and recruit the posts but sometimes it is out of our control and we do always look to do things slightly differently there'll be further opportunity through the exempt session to ask questions as well yeah, i have to say that i was struggling as to what i could actually say during that um, because i wanted to avoid any embarrassment we can, we can re -adjust that in the um when we look at the capital um spending always seems to be significant underspend. I appreciate that 
a lot of these are explained in terms of the waste vehicles and we've had answers on that and obviously delays on the depot upgrade. Um, but there's more um, variances in that, isn't there? And I'm struggling to understand whether we've, whether that's, how that accounts for all the variances. Yeah. I mean, in, clearly there are a number Sorry, of... Sorry, excuse me, Chairman. In, um, I'm having real difficulty actually hearing Ian from here. Just wondering if you could just bring it a little bit closer to... I say, Alison, I'm struggling to hear you. I don't know if you can bring your... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you can bring your microphone closer. No, because they're hot. Speak now. Right, right. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, clearly, as detailed in Appendix 3, there are a number of underspends on different schemes other than the one in, in, the, in the highlighted in the narrative report. But as answering one of the questions, most of these do relate to um, delays in schemes moving forward as opposed to genuine underspends. Clearly, one of the big areas of underspend is the loan to East Cam CLT um, for for you know, for the affordable houses, and I, I can confirm to members that as of tomorrow, we'll have paid for for four of those or contributed towards four of those houses. But obviously, that's in the 22-23 financial year, so obviously showed as a carry forward in in, in this report. Councillor Trapp. Yes, hello. Um, just a brief thing there. It's a question I, I sort of asked through our lead. Um, there's uh, overspend vehicles related to the purchase of a community bus. Have we had any reports about the success or not of the bus? Or the, not the success, but how much is being used? Is that, or is that operational services, seeing that the chair and vice chair there? I'm, I'm the lead officer for both. For both committees, um, okay. so <laughs> I have the benefit of, of, of knowing some detail. The housing advice manager is currently undertaking a review to establish the success of certain areas because there has been less attendance in 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 more rural areas than, than others. But we're trying to trial it for the rest of the summer, which and then a report or a, a briefing note rather than a report will be uh, provided to members, which will set out how it's performing in in each of the different areas. Thank you very much. Councillor Dupre. Yes, yeah, sorry to go back to the variances. I was just wondering whether Ian could explain the variance of uh, 163200 in the extension to Ely Country Park and the extension, the um, variance of 40,000 being the A14 contribution for the year. I'm not sure how that can be slippage. What, what was causing those two items in particular? Through you, Chair. I can answer the first one, which is um, we are still in the process of purchasing the land, so it's just timetabling on that one. So it's still very much in the works. And the 40,000 for the age 14 contribution is a case that it hasn't been called on yet, I would imagine. Ian? Yeah, I mean, clearly, when, when the A14 was built, the um, council made a commitment to contribute some money towards that. And we were expecting the first tranche of money to be requested from government in 21 22, but they have not. Yet done so. Any further questions for Ian? As I said in my introduction, this really is an item to note. So, are we all happy to note? Oh, do you want? I, do, I did just want to um, thank thank our officers for their careful stewardship of the budget, uh, but also just to note, I, I think it's important not to get the whole thing about the staffing. Um, out of perspective there's actually only I, i've done a, i might have got it slightly wrong but i've done a quick count uh, there's five items of the 29 that do mention um savings in in part or in whole relating to staff vacancies so i just think it's important to keep it in into in perspective um but yeah very happy to note chairman right nobody's indicating otherwise noted Brings us on to agenda item number 13, which is the Treasury Operations Annual Performance Review 
And again, Ian can ask you to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. The Council had cash investments at the end of the March 2022 of 33.53 million. This is an increase of 14.65 million over the year. At this time, the Council also had a loan outstanding with ECTC of 4.9 million. Reasons for the increase in cash holdings are detailed in section 4.2 of the current report. The committee is asked to recommend to the full council that it approves this report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. I will propose from the Chair that we recommend to full council. Do I have a seconder? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bovington. Members, comments, questions to Ian? Councillor Harris? I, I just have one question. Um, on page 13, item six, the economy and interest rates. Now, generally speaking, um, I, I think that treasury management is, is a strength. And the reports, uh, I think I've gone on record as saying that I think the reports tend to be uh, well-written and show a very good understanding of the way major trends in the world economy are, are moving. So, so that's, that's definitely a benefit. I, I have a real concern about section six um, because it, it rather blandly puts down our, our current problems to COVID, which, are, which of course struck every other developed economy as well. And the only growth rate that it mentions is the 9% uh, um, bubble, really, that came as a, as a result of opening up after, after COVID. There is virtually no doubt, it remains to be confirmed, but there is no doubt in most people's minds that we are now in recession. I mean, we have to wait for a few weeks to, to know that for certain. But anybody who is operating in this economy understands that we are in quite serious trouble right now. Uh, it's not a party political issue. Um, it's just a context that has to be dealt with. And I personally am disappointed with this section because it seems to me that it is not being completely realistic. First of all, about the relative weakness of the British economy compared in particular to other European economies, where it is now a matter of public record that we are the slowest growing at the moment, um, if we're growing at all, and are likely to be the slowest growing for at least the next two years. We're probably not in the G7 anymore, and we have definitely taken a permanent hit as a result of the, the word that dare not speak its name which appears nowhere in, the, in this report, Brexit. We hear that coronavirus has caused serious damage to the economy, caused serious damage to everyone's economy. They bounce back, we have not, because we have a permanent four to 5% reduction in GDP. So the entire, the entire background in which treasury management is taking place over the next two years minimum is different from the picture that is presented here. Now, I don't doubt that Ian knows this and the people you're working with, because the situation is so fast moving that whatever you wrote a month ago is already out of date. But I just think that we need more frequent updates here. We need to be absolutely clear that a very prudent approach is going to be taken over the way that the council's money is managed over the next couple of years. And by the way, that is not to imply that I think it wouldn't be as a matter of course. I'm absolutely sure the team will do its absolute best and they are very professional, nothing but praise for them. But I just think there's a red light flashing in this document and we need to note that when we note the rest of the report. That, that's, just wanted to read that into the record, please. Thanks. I'm not sure that was a question that Ian, do you, do you want to? I was going to say, I'm not sure there was a question. I'm there. terribly sorry. It was, no, you're right. It was a bit of a ramble. I, I didn't realise. I thought this was the debate. Sorry. I'll, I'll take the nice comments anyway. Um, all I would say is this much of the narrative of this report is based on the end of financial year, based in March, at the end of March 2022. So, therefore, some of it 
I, can I what you're saying will be updated in, in a future report when, when that's um, published. Thank you. It is now we move to the debate as to whether we recommend this to full council. Or do I just go straight to the vote? All in favour of recommending to full council, please show. Thank you. It's a unanimous placing. Right, members, we now move to items for noting and agenda item 14 is the assets update. And can I ask Spencer Clark to introduce this item? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to say that although there's not quite much added on paper since we last last met, I'd love to just uh, confirm that we are working hard in the backgrounds and we are pushing quite forward quite quickly on, on some of the works and at the depot especially, which will start commencing on Monday with the security fencing starting being installed. Uh, we have now closed the tenders on the security at the depot as well, security tender for the cameras and uh, that has now been scored at the present moment, and we're just starting the process of a quite a tricky procurement process for the treatment plant. But obviously, that's quite a high value sum of uh, infrastructure that we're putting in there, so we want to make sure we get it right. Um, other little work that are taking place fairly soon is Barton Road Car Park. We started to have some uh, repair work done in there again on Monday, this coming Monday, and um, there are quite a few other small projects in the background. Uh, that's pretty much sums it up for now. Any quite happy to take any questions sir. Thank you Spencer. Members, questions for Spencer. We're asked to note this report. Are we all happy to note it? Oh sorry Councillor. Yes I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Spencer for his high level of cooperation. He and I work together and I've never had anything but helpful and positive assistance from him and, it, and it's really an example of how any officer could work and i'd just like to say thank you to them thank you Councillor. hold on spencer <laughs> right if there's nothing further on that one we'll move to agenda item 15. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. annual reports of representatives on outside bodies tracy Thank you, Chairman. Um, as members will know, I did circulate an additional report that had come in after the agenda dispatch from Councillor, Councillor Joshua Schumann, so you should all receive that via email. Um, and apologies, it, it is normally a report for noting, but as well, one should have slipped one way, one should have slipped the other, because at the last minute we did find out that one of our internal drainage boards is slightly out of sync from the others. Um, it seems to have a three-year period rather than a four-year period. So there is a recommendation at 2.1 for former councillor David Chaplin to be reappointed to Water Beach IDB. Um, we did try to sort of get to the bottom of why it is different. We contacted South Pams, but they didn't seem to have any further information. So as a sort of security exercise, we just wanted to put this in just to make sure that if, 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 if there was an expiry period, it, it was covered. Thank you, Tracy. I'm happy to propose from the chair the recommendations, including that David Chaplin be reappointed as the joint rep on Water Beach. Can I have a seconder? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the explanation of that was fine. I'm thinking about that. that 2.1 recommendation and I understand why we need to do that to synchronize um, things back. It, it just struck me that we might want to add at the end for the remainder of the municipal year 2022-3 for the avoidance of doubt, um, not least because we haven't had a report from Mr Chaplin, um, which is disappointing, I think. Um, but I, I thought I'd like to propose that we add that for clarity so that we know why we're doing it. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm happy to accept that as well. I'll <laughs> Yep, you propose, I second it. Any further questions to Tracy? Right, so are we happy to note this all in favour, please show. Thank you. Brings us on to agenda item 16, 
which is the bus cycle war working party minutes report. Does anybody have anything they wish to raise on this? Or are we just happy to note it? Thank you. Noted. Item 17 is actions taken by the Chief Executive on the grounds of urgency. Emma, do you have anything to introduce on this? Or? Nothing to add to what's been reported, Chairman. No, another item for noting. Are we all happy to note? Thank you. It's noted. Item 18 is the forward agenda plan. Tracy, do you have anything to add to what's there? No, Chairman, we've got no changes that I'm aware of at the moment. Members, are we happy to note? Councillor Dupre. Can I just ask, we, we had a discussion earlier about the um, infrastructure fund um, and when that was going to happen. And we were told we were going to, that it was going to committee on the 24th of November, but it doesn't seem, is that the actual annual infrastructure funding statement or is that something different? Because if that's something different, then that item isn't actually on the forward plan. It no. is absolutely something different. We can seek to include yeah, it. No, that, that's right. We, 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 I, I did think about putting it, but I thought it might actually sort of seem like we were preempting the decision. So I deliberately didn't put it on because I thought, it might sort of imply that we're going to take it as a rubber stamping exercise but now that you have approved that recommendation obviously that will go on to the november one right thank you all right if there's nothing further on the forward agenda plan we now move to exempt items if any member does not agree with the exclusion of the public including representatives of the press can they please indicate now Karen, can you close down the feed then, please? 